We're very pleased to welcome onto our reading panel Landig White, um, who was born in South Wales in, in uh, 1940, I'm licensed to say. Um, he taught at the University of the West Indies, Trinidad, where he was chief arranger for a steel band um, with lots of musicians, and none of them have brought their instruments, but never mind. Uh, he's also taught at the University of Malawi, uh, from where he was deported in 1972, and at uh, the University of Sierra Leone, where he wrote the novel Inspector Tucker and the Leopard Man, and uh, also at the University of Zambia, uh, where he was teaching his first book, when, uh, where he was teaching when his first book, V.S. Naipaul, A Critical Introduction, was published. Uh, he's taught at York, uh, where he joined the Center for South African Studies where, and becoming its director in 1984. And here he wrote two Mozambican histories, the history of a village in Malawi, a study of South African praise poetry, uh, an anthology of African oral poetry co-authored with Jack Mapanje, and three collections of his own verse, Traveler's Palm, Arab Work, and Singing Bass. Uh, wonderfully entitled, Where the Angolans Are Playing Football, Selected and New Poetry, was published by Parthian in 2003. And since 1994, he's taught at the, I hope I'm going to uh, pronounce this right, Universidade Aberta, Open University in Lisbon, uh, and his translation of Camões's uh, great Portuguese national epic, The Lusiads, won the Teixeira Gomes Prize in 1998. And um, Landig is a, a member of Academy. And we're going to ask him to read first, and then um, I'm simply going to ask the poets to read in, in order of seating in the, at, the, at the panel. Landig, thank you. I think you should do that afterwards, if you wish, not before. <laughs> As um, Daniel said, I live in Portugal these days. We've been there for about 17 years. When we first moved to Portugal, my wife and I, we had to live fairly close to Lisbon because my younger son was still of school age and needed to go to the international school. Once he'd finished there, though, we moved out away from Lisbon to where we now live, in a village about uh, 20 miles northwest of Lisbon, going towards the coast. We moved to a patch of land uh, we were planning, where we were planning to build a house, and simultaneously he was about to leave to go to university here in Bristol. He went to the uh, University of the West of England. It's a very poignant moment when your children leave home. Um, obviously, they have to do it, and if they've been brought off properly, they're eager to do it. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a moment that matters. Uh, the younger son, John, it was his 19th birthday. We organized a barbecue for him and his friends on this patch of land that we'd bought before we'd built the house. And his elder brother was also, had also spent the summer with us, and they were both of them due to leave within a couple of days. Uh, we organized the event on a what we were planning to turn into a picnic area. It was a patch of land we had concreted, but done no more, no, nothing more with it. And that's the occasion that the poem describes. That's the explanation of the title, the platform. Um, something else that is referred to in the poem is a contrast that was very striking to me in my childhood. I was brought up by a, in a, a very religious household, where a distinction was made between the story of the Exodus in the first books of the Old Testament, the image of life as a pilgrimage through the desert to the Promised Land, although of course one never reached the Promised Land in this lifetime, it was after death you got there, and a very con contrasting image of uh, the settlement in Palestine, as described in the Book of the Psalms, where life is no longer a, a journey in a straight line, life is an annual cycle of springtime and harvest. And I mention that because it's referred to in the poem. The platform. John's 19th birthday barbecue, the week before they both depart. The platform by the old plum tree that once hurled me to the grounds, yet to be tiled. But no matter. There's the sound of running water and a concrete base for tables and chairs. The charcoal's already tinkling. 
and for the first time we can see the spot on East Chose gets the last of the sunset. Haven't you got a light down here, says Francisco, protesting the obvious? By the time the spare ribs are done, it's starlight, and the pepper chicken served blindfold, but delicious. There's a good wine and cold beer. We huddle in the slight chill, and Alex indulges to the full his drinking half and opening another as we toast John and celebrate his brother. The looming wall of invisible canna is a jagged tear at the sky's edge. To the west, pines are silhouetted, and revolving above us in this breeze from the furrowed Atlantic, this out-of-town blackness, are Orion and the Great Bear, the plough and distant Pleiades, conspiring with the hour hand that returns our sons to England. I confide to Elise, we create the stage on which they play out their departures, nothing more. But for her, land, ancestors and inheritance are not oases on a desert journey, but the beginning and purposed end. Every shared meal, every healed in route is like the Northern Star, a lantern, a fixity, a magnet, and a legend. I remember the Exodus and the Psalms, the antipodes of my childhood, the straight and narrow pilgrimage, the annual round of milk and honey. Like it or not, they are on their way, and their visits will be seasonal, Christmas and family summer, as the other loyalties we pray will be theirs, exert their tidal pull, delivering other ceremonies of survival. Uh, as you've heard from Daniel, I spent a good deal of my earlier life in different parts of Africa, in Malawi, Sierra Leone, uh, Zambia, and, and Mozambique, where my wife was brought up. And among the research that I did while I was there were a study of Southern African praise poetry. Uh, praise poetry is an English term for a kind of poetry that is actually more complicated than praise. There are poems addressed to chiefs, which may be praises but may be intensely critical. There are poems sung by women to their husbands, by sons to their fathers. Uh, and there are self-praises, poems in which people boast about their own achievements. And influenced by the research I did on this material, which occupied me in some years, um, I was tempted one day to try my own self-praises. This is very untypical. I very rarely write like this in a boasting fashion, but a, a, a typical self-praise will contain line by line claims to have achieved this, claims to have achieved that. Each line represents a single achievement. So this is called self-praises. Don't take it too seriously. <laughs> and it's addressed to my African age mates. I climbed the old elm tree and read William books in the rook's nest. My knee stuck in the pulpit rail. For once the congregation laughed. The missionary told of the poison ordeal. I was spellbound in the cub hut. I won the match by slicing a six off the back of the bat over backward point. I sunk, cycled a hundred miles precisely to Nettlebed and back to town. I planted crotons, a whole hedge in 32 varieties. I scored Sparrow's Melder for the steel band's panorama. I made love to the circuit minister's wife in a dark corner of the cane field. <laughs> I decamped from the island under an arch of leaping dolphins. Baboons jumped on my steaming bonnet as I st stalled on the escarpment. I crossed the longest bridge at dusk, reading of another country. I found her on a sand dune, where a coconut palm strained at its bowl. She, to whom all metaphors returned, was outlined with chevrons. She stretched like a tigress, adorned with her stripes. I watched the beetles spinning downstream, swept from the flooded causeway. My dugout parted the hyacinths in search of the hidden history. When the armed gorillas ambushed us, I said, oh, there you are. From four jobs, I resigned. From the fifth, the president deported me without rhyme or explanation. I helped at my son's birth. He came out looking dumbfounded. My proudest expedient, bribing our baby onto the plane. 
The professor rang at midnight. My poem was a masterpiece. I designed and built a kitchen to a millimetre's calculation. I knuckled down to 15 years of mortgages and pension. I campaigned for my dear friend to step forth like Lazarus. My vine in Viking territory was a miracle of survival. My garden exploded in poppies and cornflowers. Autumn blazed in nasturtiums. He wrote marvellously of his resurrection. It was I who gave the writing space. They shook hands, enemies to the vein. They shook hands and reminisced across my conference table. The student wrote, thank you. Who else could we have got drunk with? As a scholar, I set the paradigm. As a poet, I found my niche. Let these praises float from my window, setting fires where they will. <laughs> and to conclude, this one is called When Paul Salam Met Heidegger. I think you will know of this celebrated meeting between Paul Salam, the German poet of Jewish descent, and Heidegger, the philosopher who was so tarnished by his association uh, with the Nazis. Uh, they met because Celan was a great admirer of Heidegger. And in the course of their discussion, Celan asked, where do the Jews and gypsies fit into your philosophical system? And the story goes that Heidegger had no answer. So instead, they went for a walk in the forest, sharing their knowledge of the local plants. And Celan's own poem about the encounter focuses on the orchid as a plant that can produce new and strange forms from nowhere. When Paul Celan met Heidegger. When Paul Celan met Heidegger in that black forest hut where the philosopher and nature met in the manner of soiled centuries, his question hung in the damp air. What of Jews and the gypsies? Blue-eyed Hitler, vegicologist, anti-smoker and folklorist, concentrated all wanderers and earthed them in his fires. Such was the poet's right to ask, the philosopher was silenced. And it echoes wherever a plot's patrolled to it, what of refugees, aliens, asylum sisters and seekers, Palestinians? Celan found beautiful sport in the orchid, I write in praise of the canine hybrid that claims its space by hoisting a leg, no matter who planted the lamppost. Thank you. I'll read a few things that are, uh, uh, that are about translation coming at it from different angles. Um, they're either translations or address the issue, whether it's some one end of the spectrum or the other. Uh, I'll start off with a, uh, it's a prose thing, prose poem, and it's called The Version, uh, and it's a kind of paranoid uh, fantasy. <coughs> the Version. Like many of my colleagues, I too received the envelope of dark green card bearing the blue and gold stamp of their far off land and the invitation to contribute a new poem to be translated for the 500th edition of their journal, which would contain nothing but foreign poets. This was soon after the Sl Slovenian business, and I would rather have hacked my hand off at the wrist and see my work diminished in that manner again, but my mortgage payment was looming, and the line rate was impossibly generous, so I conceived of a brilliant plan. I would write a poem about translation, designed to lose precisely everything in translation. Such would be the density of its idiom, the Baroque recursion of its argument, the depth of its lyric intrigue. Its subject, or at least such tiny part of it as could be paraphrased, was a poem so volatile that it burst spontaneously into flames before it could be read. The version would consist of my biographical note and photograph opposite, opposite a blank recto carrying only an apology from the editor. My notoriety would be instantaneous. I daydreamed. From that day, I would be known in their land as the silent poet. My blank books would be a set text at their universities. I would be flown to their stadia to not read to thousands. 
I sent off my single copy of the work with a firm request that they destroy the original after the translation was made, for the silent poet leaves no trace. As I'd predicted, a succession of their own poets docked out, claiming everything from migraine to the sudden deaths of close family members. But rather than give up, they passed it on to some professor of stylistics. Being one of those smart asses whose game is to make something of anything, of nothing, if necessary, he seems to have read my barely moving lips and drew his conclusions. Whether he had intended to honour my request to delete the, the original or not is irrelevant. We can assume my poem was lost when a flunked student of his turned arsonist and raised his house to the ground. When they sent me my author's copy of the journal, assuming correctly that I did not know one word of their raucous, glide and liquid free tongue, they thought I might be interested to know what their man had made of it. This reverse translation had been made, I ascertained, by some chap who had worked on software manuals. The rendering as prose and consequent loss of my immaculate Alexandrines I could have predicted, but as far as I could recall, my original bore no relation to this poem in any way. However, what animated me at the time, and I find this hilarious, was its facile mise on a beam and its somewhat blokish and ludic tone, given I'd quit doing that sort of thing 15 years ago. And then the real horror began. A friend alerted me to the fact that someone had submitted this garrulous bullshit to some magazine in my name. When I wrote to the editor to protest, she merely referred me to three other journals where the version had also appeared, each time in completely different form. One is violently pornographic and directs the reader towards a number of illegal sites on the dark web. Another accuses in virulently anti-Semitic terms another poet by name of sleeping with his own sister. Another yields an acrostic insulting the prophet Muhammad. My increasingly hysterical protestations fall on deaf ears. Within a week, I hear I've been dropped from several reading lists and a Bell laureate is suing me for plagiarism. A series of public readings has been cancelled. Now my work is returned from journals unopened. My agent has dropped me. And yesterday I received an email from my publisher saying, under the current circumstances, we cannot, in all conscience, continue to support your work. While I dwindle, the version proliferates. I write this in the cupboard under the stairs, the pounding on the front door growing louder. I daren't let them hear me breathe. Uh, this is um, it's a sort of a translation uh, uh, in as much as it's uh, uh, intertextual. And something that's occurred to me today is um, uh, the degree to which we'll have to see the intertextual as, as, as uh, continuous with the idea of translation. I hadn't really thought about it in that way before, but I do now. Uh, and this is, um, uh, it was a, a commission, which normally don't go well, and this may not have either. But it's, um, it was uh, about acting. Uh, it was a, a commission to write about uh, those wonderful Titians on the, uh, on the death of Actaeon. Um, uh, and this sort of takes its inspiration or is derived from uh, the Ovid version of the Actaeon myth and Metamorphosis. Uh, and there's a, that wonderful bit in particular that I use as a tag uh, uh, at the start. The poem's called A Calling, I should say. Um, that wonderful bit where Actaeon has been uh, turned into the stag by Diana. Uh, and his own dogs are, are set upon him. And, uh, but the, the members of his, of, of his hunting troop are calling out his name, saying, Actian, wh where are you, you know? Uh, but he's at that moment being transformed into the, into the beast. And, uh, and he says, Velet a basi quidem sed ad est. He would rather he was not here, but he is here. A winter train, a gale, a poacher's moon. The black glass. Do I honestly still blame the wrong turn in the changing rooms I took when I was six and stood too long to look? The scream Miss Venner loosed at me. The nerve. I was ablaze. And it was worth the shame, I thought. Of course I did. It was too soon to tell the dream from what I'd paid for it. Then soon too late, two sides of the same door. Was it the bow's recoil or its release that lashed the world so out of shape? Tonight I stare right through the face that I deserve as all my ghost dogs gather at the shore 
the dark sea at their back like the police. Uh, I'll read a, a couple of versions from Antonio Machado that, that represent the kind of extremes of translation that we talked about today. One is a very, very uh, 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 straight translation, almost just word for word, uh, uh, what's in the original. And sometimes that goes just fine, <laughs> you know. And I think you, you know, it's um, the whole point about versioning is it's a process and not an operation. So it's as long as it need be, and you know, if you get lucky, it, be, it can be quite a short process. Um, the point is just the validation of that the, of the worth of that process. Nothing. Point called nothing. Sorry. So is this magic place to die with us? I mean that world where memory still holds the breath of your early life, the white shadow of first love, the voice that rose and fell with your own heart, the hand you dream of closing in your own, all those beloved burning things that dawned on us lit up the inner sky. Is this whole world to vanish when we die, the life that we made new in our own fashion? Have the crucibles and anvils of the soul been working for the dust and for the wind. Uh, and at the other extreme, there were a couple of poems that just came out of, uh, of the experience of, of uh, trying to version uh, Machado uh, and reading the kind of things he was reading at the time. He was reading uh, 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 the kind of turn of the century, uh, uh, Henri Bergson and um, uh, Miguel de Unamuno. Um, and, uh, and I think this has uh, influenced this poem, which is no relation to any original Machado wrote, but couldn't have been written in my voice. Uh, paradoxes. It's in two parts. Just as the lover's sky is bluest, the poet's muse is his alone. The dead verse and its readership have lives and muses of their own. The poem we think we have made up may still turn out to be our truest. Two. Only in our sorrows do we live within the heart of consciousness, the lie. Meeting his master, crying in the road, a student took so long to task. But why, your son so long in the ground, do you still grieve for him? If, as you say, man's tears avail him nothing. Young friend, said Solon, lifting his old head, I weep because my tears avail me nothing. And I'll just finish off with a wee poem from uh, Rilke, uh, which is an elegy for a childhood friend, uh, uh, his cousin, actually, um, which I've given a title called The Ball. <clears throat> what happened to that little brotherhood, lords of the scattered gardens of the city? We were all so shy. I never understood how we hooked up in the first place. Like the lamb with a scroll that spoke, we two spoke in silence. It seemed when we were happy, it was no one's. Whose ball was it? In all the anxiety of that last summer, it melted in the scrum. The street leaned like a stage set. The traffic rolled around us like huge toys. Nobody knew us. What was real in that all? Nothing, just the ball, its glorious arc, not even the kids. But sometimes one already fading stepped below it as it fell. Thank you. I'm just going to read from translations. Um, versions. Uh, these are by Goran Simic, my versions of Simic. Um, for those of you who don't know, these poems were written under siege in Sarajevo. And this is called The Sorrow of Sarajevo. The Sarajevo wind leafs through newspapers that are glued by blood to the street. I pass with a loaf of bread under my arm. The river carries the corpse of a woman. As I run across the bridge with my canisters of water, 
I notice her wristwatch still in place. Someone lobs a child's shoe into the furnace. Family photographs spill from the back of a garbage truck. They carry inscriptions. Love from, love from, love. There's no way of describing these things, not really. Each night I wake and stand by the window to watch my neighbor who stands by the window to watch the dark. A common story. Sarajevo, January 1993. My friend put his wife and children on the bus to God knows where and wrote on the frozen window, I am with you. After that moment, he wrote no more. I signed his army ID card. I wrote his request for transfer to God knows where. I wrote the first appeal. I wrote the second. I wrote love letters to his wife and kissed his children each a hundred times. I wanted to sign these letters from someone whose words have been sluiced into the sewer by whoever cleans the shit and snow off buses. When they brought him to the hospital, it seemed that half his body was missing. I ran to read him a letter from his wife, the first letter she'd sent, a love letter I'd written as fast as I could. He didn't hear me. He was breathless, dying for breath, trying to find enough breath to say out loud the words that had been sluiced into the sewer by whoever cleans the shit and snow off buses. Rusha and the trams. All that remains of Rusha is the weasel fur from, her, from the collar of her coat and a monthly pass for the tram. Now all the trams rust on the rails and Rusha takes long walks with the angels. Her wardrobe is hung with shadows. The only thing real is the greasy fingerprint left on her tram pass by the conductor. I wonder if he's still alive. I wonder whether in some other life his fingers might touch the weasel fur on Rusha's collar. I don't know. Honest to God, I don't know how to think about that after a year of war. This is, um, I said earlier in my talk that I had made a version of Ambo, and uh, this is it. <laughs> um, it's uh, my version of, um, of Ambo to Chichez de, de Pou, uh, the women who search for lice. I call it scalp hunters. The child cried without waking. When they went in and stroked his head, the two sisters, they could feel the dried blood in his hair like husks in a web. They set him by a window open to the moor, still dreaming, but he caught the dawn wind sharp with broom and brine. Their fingers spindle thin, cool, careful, clever, drew a pattern of spells from brow to nape, asleep, but he heard them breathing as they worked, 
the rhythm of patience, or else they'd whisper together. One licked a dab of spittle back with a quick hiss, and their touch lifted an instant. Tongue and lip and spit made him think of kisses. Eyes closed, but he heard their eyelashes blatter the air and felt their fingertips skim thin electric tra tracks across his scalp. Nipped out, the lice cracked like shellac underneath their nails. And soon his only ambition lay in their hands, in dreams like that dream, in the blind, beguiling, fathomless desire, held back, let go, held back, let go again, to cry without waking. And <clears throat> these few are my versions of, of the great Greek master, Yanis Ritsos. Um, this poem is called Women. It's so typical of Ritsos. Our women are distant. Their sheets smell of good night. They put bread on the table as a token of themselves. It's then that we finally see we were at fault. We jump up saying, look, you've done too much. Take it easy. I'll light the lamp. She turns away with the striking of the match, walking towards the kitchen, her face in shadow, her back bent under the weight of so many dead those you both loved, those she loved, those you alone loved, yes, and your death also. Listen, the bare boards creaking where she goes. Listen, the dishes weeping in the dish rack. Listen, the trains taking soldiers to the front. This is called 1972. Each night, gunfire. Come dawn, a sudden silence. Blank walls, floors scrubbed clean, chairs arranged just so. Think of a door, and beyond it, a door, and another door beyond that. The spaces between, crammed with the kind of cotton waste they use to fill the mouths of the starving or the dead. Our heroes are small men, pasty-faced and fat. Two more. This is called lopsided. He chalked a lopsided square on the floor. He drew a door and stepped inside. He drew a window, then in the corner, the outline of a woman. Light from the window struck a glitter off the crystal chandelier. The woman was naked. She would have to be. It wasn't a question of belief. We all knew that. After a moment, he stepped back through the door and shrugged and brushed the chalk dust from his hands. And finally, um, this is called The Kiss. The sea was dark in the sun. He put his mouth on hers. How strange that coming together. Her spittle was wine and salt, 
Later, he took salt from the tip of her breast with the tip of his tongue. She woke to a scream and went to the window. There were cats on the ridge tiles. An old woman was reading a letter by the glow from a street lamp. Music ran under the sound of the sea. Next morning they walked through an avenue of statues, broken limbs, blind eyes taking the light. I have never loved anyone, he said. Surely you know that. The scent of trodden herbs was everywhere. As um, Michael Longley once remarked, there's no such thing as a short poetry reading, so um, I'm, uh, I'm, as it were, the last man standing. So thank you for listening to us and uh, participating in the obsessive conversation which we can't stop having. I'm going to read the first part of a poem which was obviously influenced by my working on translation of The Inferno. I wrote a poem called On the Tune, which is a three-canto version of The Inferno and the Purgatorio and the Paradiso, which takes place in Newcastle upon Tyne. And it starts in a very famous pub in, uh, in Newcastle down by the quayside. So this is On the Tune, Canto 1. O oh, fairest of the northern waters, river god, great Tyne, I asked, flow through this language now, hydrate the tongue afresh, abolish drought and thirst, and let me drink you in to learn the meaning of our history and what must be. Send me a guide from your deep source, a water sprite, a river girl, to go with me. The clue you're looking for is 13 down, she said. It's river stairs, and learning that will cost you. Mine's a turquoise wicked. I looked up. There she sat along the bar, in the unmoving reaches of the afternoon, among the far-gone gadges in the crown posada. Bold as brass, with long black hair, green eyes, a tiny dress of shifting emerald and jet. I put the paper down and fetched her drink, and as she raised it to her lips, it seemed we stood beside the tyne by night, no moon, a black tide licking past, ourselves alone. A boat was waiting, moored beneath the stairs. She led me down, took up the oar, and as we stood upright, traghetto style, she swung us out beneath the great arch of an unknown bridge, and on, into the secret hell of time. First came a labyrinth of flooded passageways with dead men laboring waist deep in ice to win the coal that never reached the light. I saw them crushed between the jaws of tunnels only to unearth themselves and then resume their labors with a passion whose futility they knew would, but would not bow to. No one spoke. As we mowed off, the echo of their picks came after us a little way until the stream grew broad again and steered us to a subterranean sargasso, the breaker's yard of all the ironclads the Tyne had launched for the engagements at Tsushima, Jutland and the rest. Among the showers of sparks, the welders moved like surgeons, opening the rusted ribs of battleships still glowing red from their exploded magazines, released into the smoky air, the drowned men sealed below decks, slid and flopped along the quays as though alive. Then silent gangs with carts would haul away these levees to augment Golgotha's pyramids. What does this mean? I asked my guide. Bad faith, she said. To know and not remember, to remember in a lie, to claim to want the lost world back. Bad faith can have no history, only sentiment. 
She could have been a girl from Scotswood, Biker, Wall's End, Shields, and yet she said these things. Then she, then she slipped off her tall red shoes. Massage me feet, she ordered while our vessel slid among the burnt-out staiths and over reefs of sunken cars, where twockers gazed back disbelievingly as fish went stitching deftly through the sockets of their eyes. We're nearly there, although you're not exactly dressed for clubbing. Smart, good, casual, I said. Aye, in your dreams. Stay close, say now, and do what I do, right? A wall of smoke arose before us, Warehouse windows speaking bursts of flame as wooden tenements consumed themselves and everyone inside, while firestorms tore down the city's spires and night ran red and black and gold as in a biblical comeuppance. Vast explosions in the riverbed threw gouts of mud and bones around us, yet the girl betrayed no fear but brought us to a cobbled ramp that seemed to tunnel upwards through the fire, and at its head a pair of vast red doors stood open, guarded by a triple-headed bouncer, all immaculate in black, who chewed his wad with the ferocity of Alex Ferguson. We're on the list, she said, he waved <coughs> us in. Beyond there lay a wilderness of mirror work and false light, flaming ever more exclusive rooms, the whole place sweated heartless noise to which dog-headed dancing girls performed in leotards of black and white while slabs of lard in dandruff suits rewarded them with absolute unsmiling concentration, feeding powder up their ruined noses as a timeless duty princes of the city deigned to undertake. So here's where money came to waste itself, Let's stick to lemonade, she said. It took them centuries of violent integrity to bring jordismo to perfection. Here's the fruit they like to claim of all that grim endeavor, samurai of self-indulgent crap who bloom like cherry blossoms. So, now let them die. On giant screens by the Olympic pool of schnapps, the match was on. Was that gig lane? But no one watched, since even here at Pleasure Central, everybody knew the game was up. Tonight was next time, us foretold. Tonight was fire. And as I thought this, flames burst from the pumps and loud men's mouths, a final utterance that kept the faith with all that proud extremity and had no breath to waste on content after all. And something that's more closely a translation. Um, it's a very short poem from the Chinese, which cost me extraordinary um, efforts. So I hope you'll respond appropriately. <laughs> it's a poem called Sung Dynasty. My lover tells me that when autumn comes, he will fashion me a boat of cherry blossom. There's no way I'm getting in that. <laughs> <laughs> and to finish, thank you for listening to us, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, um, I started to go deaf, as middle-aged people do. And it got to the point where my nearest and dearest was shouting at me in the car because I couldn't hear what she was saying. And on alternate days, I had the initials ODB. Sometimes it would be, oh, darling boy, and other times it would be, oh, deaf bastard. Um, so I went to get some um, hearing aids fitted, and I did on the NHS, God love them. Uh, but I found that I could hear absolutely everything, far, far, far too much. It was like being Ray Milland in The Man with X-Ray Eyes, only it was with the ears. And one day when I was doing a reading with David and Don in Cheltenham, I began to pick up Radio Luxembourg, <laughs> even though they'd ceased broadcasting several years before. So this is called Audiology, and I suppose it's about knowledge. Thank you for listening. And um, 
audiology. I hear an elevator sweating in New Orleans, water folding black on black in tanks deep under Carthage, unfracked oil in Lancashire and what you're thinking. It's the truth. There goes your silent count to ten, the held breath of forbearance, all the language not yet spoken or unspeakable, the dark side of the page. But this is not about you. I can hear the sea drawn back from Honshu, hookers in the holding pen and loggeria in the dreaded quiet coach, the firestorm of random signs on market indices, the bull, the bear, the sound of one hand clapping and the failure of the reins, the crackle of the dried out stars, stars being born, anomalies and either or, the soundtrack of creation in an unrecorded vowel, the latest that might be the last, the leading edge of all that is the case or is not there. The contradictions cover such a range. And I'm told that soon it will be easier to balance out the love cry and the howl, to wear an aid and act my age, to hear the world behind this world and not to crave amnesia. Thank you.